Hello, my name is Woody. Thank you for listening to Change in the House of Pods, a podcast about Deftones. My guest today is Chris Enriquez, a guy so nice I spoke to him twice. Uh, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, Chris is the drummer for Spotlights. That was a clip from their song, Continue the Capsize. Spotlights uh, toured with Deftones and refused in 2016. So you'll hear about that today and about his experience interviewing the band for Revolver. Uh, Well, more specifically, he's going to talk about a pretty wild time he had after he interviewed them. Nutty. Uh, Chris is also one of the hosts of Age of Quarantine, which is cool as hell. If you haven't checked it out on Instagram or YouTube, Chris has been talking to amazing musicians, and he's super smart, so he asks great questions, and he has a ton of great insight. He also plays guitar uh, in a hardcore band called Total Meltdown, and being from New York, he's been a big fan of Sergio Vega for a long time. So he told me some cool stuff about Sergio I, I didn't know. I had a ton of fun talking to Chris, especially the second time around. So, uh, okay, uh, what had happened was I was recording our conversation, but Zoom, like, Zoomed on me. So I lost half of it. I, I didn't lose it. More like Zoom took it. At any rate, uh, because I fucked up, I reached out to Chris, and he was cool enough to talk to me a second time and hang out with me even longer. So for the first 25 minutes or so, you're going to hear part of our first conversation, and I will uh, jump in before we move into the second one. This is my conversation with Chris Enriquez. I got into Deftones uh, pretty much right, w- literally like within weeks of Adrenaline coming out. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that was 1995 um, as I was starting to get into shows, like going and, going and seeing shows and bands on my own. Uh, when I say that, I'm talking about hardcore shows, of course. Like I was starting to get old enough to, to go out on my own and check stuff out. And I remember... Um, people in the Long Island hardcore scene talking about Deftones a lot. And um, oddly enough, I remember some of the guys in Glassjaw, I, I say that ironically because there's a, obviously like a, um, a little bit of a similarity in their sound. And at that time, they didn't sound like that at all. But I remember them talking very highly of uh, Deftones. And I had to check out, you know, what, what it was all about. And um, I was a huge Bad Brains fan. So and a quicksand fan. So I, there was something about that first record that really resonated with me. You hear a little of that Bad Brains influence and there's a similarity there with uh, quicksand and I was, I was hooked, man. And I also remember hearing about them because they were on the Crow, on the Crow 2 soundtrack, um, yeah. I think in the movie. So that was really how I first found out about Deftones. Were you playing in bands at that time? I was. I was playing in uh, not, not, no bands that were worth mentioning that were known or anything like that. I was in a, I was in an all Asian emo band called Fall with Grace. Back That's when totally worth there. mentioning. That is absolutely <laughs> worth mentioning. Yeah, That's back awesome. back when emo wasn't a shitty word. It was we were into like uh, you know, Fugazi and um, you know, that that sort of jawbox and that sort of thing. It wasn't like embarrassing yet. <laughs> but you mentioned like uh, a lot of people from the Long Island hardcore scene were were into Deftones. Do you think it was uh, do you think that was the case or was it just sort of your immediate circle of friends? No, it was definitely the case. And, 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 you know, one thing I'll say that makes a lot of sense about that is that, uh, you know, the Long Island hardcore scene eventually became popular for bands like Glassjaw and Take Back Sunday and Brand New or whatever. But at the time, uh, there were some really good bands, uh, that you could say were a little off kilter. They, you know, we called it hardcore, but it wasn't like New York hardcore, like Agnostic Front or Chrome Eggs. Like there were bands that were considered hardcore in Long Island that sounded like Jane's Addiction, but would call themselves hardcore. There were bands that sounded like Fugazi that would call themselves hardcore. So there was something about the Deftown sound when we all heard it for the first time that kind of sounded like what we were associating ourselves with already, uh, with this sort of like post hardcore, uh, you know, post grungy kind of thing that was going on. And they just resonated with a lot of people I knew in the scene. Um, melodic vocals, heavy music. Those were some characteristics of bands at the time. Uh, you know, I could reference Silent Majority or Glass Jar, Mind Over Matter. Those are some bands that were around at that time that, uh, you know, not, they don't necessarily sound like Deftones, but like the, the idea of melodic vocals and heavy music and heavy guitars and stuff. I think that's why people in Long Island really liked the Deftones so much. So did you find yourself coming back like for every album after that? Were you pretty much like a, a fan or did... Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Immediately. Um, I lo- I'll, I'll be honest with you. I liked Adrenaline 
I, I wasn't like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing I ever heard until I heard um, Around the Fur when I was in college. That w was like my jaw dropped. So I liked Adrenaline. I came to appreciate it more later. There's obviously classics on there, but it was really Around the Fur where my jaw hit the floor and I fucking listened to that record over and over again. What about it? What, what, was, what did it for you? For, for one thing, I really liked the production on it. Like, uh, there's a slicker production on that. I think it's the same producer, right? Terry Date, but there was mm -hmm. something about that production that did it for me. I was always, uh, I'll compare it to like, like Tool, Automa had a very, like, kind of slick production and uh, quicksand manic compression. And like, that record to me had something about it that, that had that production value that I liked. And the songs, um, you know, he, I feel like that was the beginning of Chino really getting super melodic. Um, you know, uh, we, we hear he's, he's got melodic vocals on, on adrenaline, but the songs got more melodic too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, be quiet and drive, you know, that obviously is a good example. That's a classic, but just, just the, in general, there was just something more melodic happening there. The, 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 the balance of the heaviness and the um, and the and the and the and the melody blended for me in in the best way possible. I mean, we're talking about you have a song with Max Cavalera where it's fucking brutal as fuck, and uh, and then and then and then you have like these really emotive, beautiful vocals, and it wasn't cheesy, you know. Um, it was it was just perfect. Something about it was perfect and dark, you know. And so in, in college at, at that point, you, uh, you had your own money. You were probably playing in bands still. So, and, and a big fan of Deftones, were you like t-shirts, posters? Were you like that heavy into it? Or were you very <laughs> much still like in the, the hardcore scene and sort of focused on that? At that point, I'll be honest with you. I was, at that point, I had like kind of been phasing out of like the, the traditional hardcore thing, uh, as in like I, I, I was no longer wearing uh, Snapcase shirts and wearing Jenkos and then and that whole thing that was going I wasn't wearing Earth Crisis t shirts at that point. I was I was starting to wear skinnier jeans and I was getting into um, things like Texas is the reason and Promise Ring and, and that was kind of like if you were at a college age and this is ninety seven, ninety eight, that's kind of like if you're a hardcore kid, especially in Long Island or New York, you might be gravitating towards that. Um, and so I really liked the Deftones, but to be honest with you, and I'm saying this lightly because they did so much for me, um, and I'm like friends with those guys, but the new metal thing was sort of like, they got lumped in with it, even though they weren't really a new metal band. Um, they did a great job distancing themselves from that. So I was always afraid to like, Dread, like to, to rock anything that would make people think I was like into um, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So, but I would listen to it all the time. And me and my friends talked about them all the time and we put them in the same boat as like hum, you know, or bands like society real estate or hum that were like cool. Um, and uh, you know, but yeah, so I wasn't, I didn't have posters or shirts, but I listened to them all the time and I talked about it a lot. <laughs> Since you uh, since you brought it up, and um, actually a couple of things, because I want to ask you about um, uh, seeing them uh, on tour, if you'd gotten that opportunity yet, because you mentioned Snapcase, and it was probably about that time that they were touring with Snapcase and, and Quicksand. Uh, but also um, talking about sort of uh, how they get lumped into a scene. And and it's it's so like tired to hearing like them getting, getting lumped in with new metal. I wonder if you if you think uh, a couple of things, like if they should be lumped in more with those bands like uh, Hum and Sunny Day Realist, I th I've always thought like more Smashing Pumpkins because that's sort of the similar era that they emerged out of. Um, but I, I'm also curious to ask you, like if, who are their peers now? Like if Ohms was the only album that you'd ever heard, like where, where would you put them? You know, it's funny. That's a, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's a lot of bands that I think that are not as well known that like Far from Sacramento as well. Um, they were peers. Um, they obviously did some collaborations together and stuff like that. Uh, definitely not a new metal band, definitely a post hardcore band. So I think of Deftones as like, maybe like peers that happen to get much bigger of bands like Will Haven and Far, who are both uh, from 
Sacramento, but absolutely quicksand because they were friends from, from back in the day. Um, and, and, uh, I mean, hum. And I would say, because it was like a similar era, smashing pumpkins came out a little prior to them, but, um, but I, but there's definitely a musical connection there. Um, and so, you know, to, I guess to directly answer your question, if Ohms came out today and I never heard anything else by them, that's a tough question to answer. I mean, you look, I'm going to answer it in a weird way. I know that like Chino is really into ISIS, the band, um, and he's into some more like sophisticated stuff and he's very hands on with the cool bands that he uh, picks to, to bring on tour and stuff. So I, I like to think that Deftones, if they were like a brand new band and Ohms just came out, that they would be like this cool, like this cool band that like, that would like be lumped in with, um, with like all this eclectic stuff that's coming out today, you know, um, you know, working at Revolver, it's almost like genreless at this point. Like the same person that listens to Chelsea Wolf, who is also from Sacramento, which is interesting that I just mentioned that. But the same person who listens to Chelsea Wolf probably listens to Power Trip, the Cult Leader, and 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 maybe Ghost Main. And yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I think that Deftones, if they were just like some brand new band, like you know, I'd be like, oh yeah, I listen to them and Turnstile and fucking Chelsea Wolf. They would just be like a cool new band to me you know it's interesting to think of, think of them that way too like genreless it's it is sort of genreless i think there there's it's it's new territory in a sense it's pretty cool okay so so and and uh, i mentioned the snap case uh quicksand tour have you seen them live by that point yet? like by the time that you were in college i saw them i'll never forget it i saw them uh at roseland rest in peace roseland i was a legendary new york venue a couple thousand people you could fit in that place and it was the around the fur tour um and Quicksand reunited and opened up. Snapcase was not on the bill. I think it was a band called Pitch Shifter or Metro Shifter. It was one of the either one of those shifter bands. But uh, I know this is about Deftones, but I have to say, and I'm going to drop a name here because it's interesting. But at the time, I was in a band called Runner Up that turned into Take Back Sunday, and it was with me and Eddie Reyes, the founding member of of Take Back Sunday, and he's a bigger Colombian dude, a little bit older than me, came out of like the hardcore scene and the, and the mosh pit for quicksand was more violent than any pit that I had ever seen in my life at that point, even Madball and like converge. Like I'd never seen anything like it. The entire place erupted and he got knocked out within the first song, got a concussion. They took him out to an ambulance. And I remember like trying to find a place for dear life to like hold on to because everyone was swinging. Like, the 90s for quicksand in New York City was brutal. I'm telling you, for like anything like that, that kind of music in, in New York City. So I was, I was, that's what I remember. And then, um, and then Deftones came on and fuck, it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen in my life. They were in their prime, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, I always talk about the live show experience as something that is otherworldly it's it's just a different obviously i'm biased you know i'm i'm <laughs> sort of a fan but uh that's part of the reason that i keep coming back you know what i mean like the live show is just the shit like they're just the the energy is different it's different oh yeah um, so and i think maybe that's a maybe that's a good segue into asking you like how how did you end up because i don't i don't think i've ever talked to anybody who's opened up for deftones before so uh should we should we fast forward a little bit here? I, I mean, yeah, it's totally up to I, you. I would, man. I, would, I would love to uh, talk about like all the albums and stuff and like where you rank them. Maybe maybe we'll get to that a little bit. But I do want to know about um, uh, opening for Deftones. And, and I mean, you were on tour with them like for a handful of dates. Like, tell me, it was two weeks. Yeah, it's uh, it's an amazing story, and I have to uh, I have to say it's not my story. It's it's uh, my singer Mario and. Uh, my bass player, Sarah, who's also uh, um, a singer in Spotlights. They, I wasn't in the band when this happened, I, but I um, joined uh, for the tour. So this is how the story goes. I'll try to tell it best. They might yell at me for, uh, for missing a few things. But um, Aaron Harris, the drummer for Palms, which is Chino's other band, who was uh, also in the band, in ISIS, the band, he was Abe Cunningham's uh, drum tech for years. And he's a good friend of Mario and Sarah from Spotlights. Um, they uh, played a show with Pops at some point, and, and Isis uh, is their favorite band, one of their favorite bands. 
so they had met Aaron a few times and um, um, Aaron really liked the Spotlight's debut EP, which by the way, was self-released and recorded, um, also self-recorded in a practice space. Um, really like low budget stuff. Um, he had played it on tour uh, one night for Chino. And Chino was like, what is this? It's like, oh, this is Spotlight, it's my friends. And he's like, oh, this is dope. And um, he never mentioned, from what I heard, he had never mentioned anything to Aaron or anybody about, um, you know, wanting us to go on tour. And uh, at some point, Spotlights, this is again, like prior to me joining, this is how I, this is how I became in the band, by the way. So it's like a double story. Uh, they got an email from Deftones agency, booking agency, whatever it was. And it was a guy saying, hey, wanted to know what your tour availability is like this August. And this is in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the Gore Tour. Um, yes, yeah, 2016. And uh, they're like, uh, a really big band on our roster is interested in taking you out. We can't say who it is. And they thought it was a joke. They thought someone was pranking them, and they almost didn't write back. So they thought it was like a fucking, like a, like a total hoax, or like, or like a pay-to-play, like, who is this guy? You know, those people yeah. that try to, like, get you hooked on something. But uh, for shits and giggles, they wrote back. And, like, I, 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 I don't want to misspeak, but I feel like they might have said they wrote back, like, kind of expecting one of those situations where it was going to be like, let's just see what this person has to say. Uh, eventually, the person got back to them after a couple of email exchanges, and they're like, cool, well, if you are available, here's the tour outing. And it was uh, Deftones and Refused on the Gore Tour. And they were like, holy shit. And then, um, yeah, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I think they reached out to Aaron or spoke and turned out it was real. Um, and they're like, geez, this is, this is wild. And, um, their drummer at the time couldn't do the entire tour. So they had, they had spotlights had, uh, seen me play locally in, in a couple of bands, Primitive Weapons uh, and this band Han, uh, two local bands in Brooklyn. They had seen us play a bunch, and they're like, that drummer is awesome. And, and, and at the same time, we had the same publicist as Spotlights, uh, Primitive Weapons had the same publicist, and they were like, you got to hear this band Spotlights. Um, it sounds like the kind of band you would be into, and, and the, whoever played drums on that record like sounds like you. And it was the singers, Mario, play drums on it so I it all kind of like came together I was at St. Vitus in Brooklyn which is kind of like a little CBGB's kind of place and uh and uh I met the band we became friends and when this tour offer happened um they called me this is even funnier and uh they wouldn't tell me who the tour was with and I said no they were like hey we have a tour coming up our drummer can't do it we love your drumming would you do it and I was like man I'm so flattered that you asked uh, they're like, we can't, it's with a cool band, but we can't tell you who it is, who it's with. And I was like, I, I'm really busy, but I know some drummers I could refer to you. And then they were like, look, we're, we're not going to beat around the bush, but like, you can't talk about this to anybody, but it's opening for Deftones and Refused. Can you do it? And then I, <laughs> was like, I just immediately fucking like ate my words. I'm like, oh yeah, you know what? I, I can, I can figure that. They're like, really? You just, you just figured it out that, that quickly. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. Um, you said the so magic the, word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we ended you up said on the Deftones tour. Tones refused. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I, I mean, I remember that tour uh, getting announced because it didn't make it to Minneapolis. I mean, that that was that was a cool that Deftones refused. That's oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, refused are one of my favorite bands, and I like I no offense to those guys. I love them. I I they're one of my favorite bands of all time. But I like I forgot that like they were on the tour, like that like the, the tour coming up was with them also because I was so fucking like, you know, just like, like I would like remind myself that Refused was there too and be like, oh my God, how is this even fucking happening? And, uh, and it was great. Everyone was so cool. Everyone was super, super personable and awesome. Do you, uh, does it, any standout memories from, uh, from uh, those couple <laughs> of weeks? Yeah, definitely. I mean, let me, let me preface by saying this. I, basically never played a show with spotlights which i mentioned to you before we were um uh recording so um they had already played a bunch of dates without me 
uh, and they sort of like warmed up to the whole idea of like playing shows in like casinos and like <laughs> weird fucking like amphitheaters in front of like 7,000 people. So they had like five days of experience over me. Um, and I was watching the, I was watching stuff on Instagram, on YouTube of the band that I was about to play with leading up to it, just being like, Jesus Christ. Like, and I'm like, I, I never even got a chance to fucking like try to do this in front of my friends who are like anybody. So I'm just kind of getting thrown into the fire. And uh, I watched two shows with the first drummer on the side of the stage before I even got to play one too. So like at uh, Coney Island Amphitheater and then someplace in Boston that was massive. And I'm just like, fuck man, this is wild. So I'm meeting the band, I'm meeting Deftones. I'd known Sergio for a few years already. But um, I'm meeting Refused, and I'm like, okay, it's my time. And I show up to um, Asbury Park in New Jersey to the Stone Pony, legendary if you're from around here. And, um, you know, sometimes you wonder, is the band really going to watch us? Are they really going to watch us? And uh, I, we showed up to the show late for some reason. I don't know what happened. So my first show, we were late. And as we're fucking pulling up, we're all being rushed. I can't even warm up or do anything. We're just handing my drums to like people that are bringing it on stage and there's like 6,000 people in front of the stage. And uh, I see everyone in Deftones and Refuse all walking around the stage. And um, I'm like, oh Jesus fucking Christ, I can't believe this is happening. And um, this footage of this, by the way, of, of Chino on the side of the stage the entire time, but I'm on stage playing and literally, it sounds like a made up dream. I have like fucking the guys from Refuse um, to my right on the stage, I can see them watching us and then to my left Chino is standing there with Abe and I'm like fuck <laughs> and I'm just like, it was weird and then when I was done um, Abe, I had, Abe, Abe grabbed my uh, bass drum from me like, like one of the guys that was like loading shit out and he smiled and he was like are you still nervous man? He was like, he was like so are you still nervous or what? And I'm just like uh, I, think I'm, I think I'm getting there man thank you but it was a total weird thing um, and um uh, Chino learned one of our songs and sang a song with us at our last show. No and shit, it was really, really? Yeah, he came up to us too. He was like, he's like, oh, really? Can we, you guys want to do that? And he's like nervous about fucking it up. And I'm like, what is happening? Man? <laughs> uh, trip. Yeah, and we heard him backstage listening to the song for like an hour, like trying to learn it, warming up. And then he came out on stage. It's on YouTube. And then he came out on stage and sang with us. Yeah, how did it go? Did he, did he pull it off? He pulled it off. It was awesome, man. And like, I'll never forget like the the roar of it was in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'll never forget the roar of people as he walked onto stage. I was so nervous, so nervous. Had to blow my mind a little bit. What a, yeah. what an unbelievable experience to first like to, to your first time singing the kit with the band, and you've got you're being flanked on both sides with hardly enough time to like crack your knuckles. I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, so I should mention this too, because I work at Revolver. Like, I had met and interviewed them before, as a as like a as a journalist, <laughs> but I don't know if they remembered me. So, it was, and it was it was like I had interviewed Deftones like two months before this tour happened. Really, not not knowing that I was going to be in this band on tour, so it was like a trip. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I mentioned it to them, but I don't know if they actually remembered. Sure. What, uh, what was that experience like for you, interviewing them? Okay, you ready for this? This is why I wanted to come on your podcast. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Um, a really weird story about this. So I flew out to South by Southwest um, in 2016, just a few months. I think that um, South by Southwest happens in March, and this tour was in August. So that's how close this was. So I interviewed Deftones uh, backstage. I interviewed Sergio and... Um, Chino for a Revolver podcast and it was great. They were sweet as hell. Um, really great guys. And um, after I, because I, I've known Sergio from living in New York. He used to DJ in between Quicksand and Deftones. He, he was just kind of DJing and he DJed down the street from my place a lot in the, in the East Village. So I would go down there and watch him DJ and there would be nobody there. It would be like him and Chaka from Orange Shine Millimeter and we would just like be all fucking fanning out even though there was nobody there. <laughs> and um, so I, I was like, oh man, like let's, like after the, I, I was like, I'm in, I'm in Texas if you want to hang out. And um, my, my best friend who sings in Total Meltdown, Ralph and I 
they, they invited us to hang out with them. And I was like, kind of shit in my pants. And I'm like, let's be cool. Like, they want us to hang out with them. Let's not act like fans. We got to like, just try to calm down. And we're meeting up with Frank, uh, Abe, and Sergio, and like a bunch of their friends to go to a cool Keith show. Um, and, That's so and, dope. At like midnight in Texas, like just like meeting up with a bunch of dudes, like, hey, nice to meet you. Like, what's going on? Like, I'm like, let's just not even address like who they are. Yeah. So we, <laughs> so we get there and, uh, and we all, there was a riot outside on the street. Uh, and we never walked into the show because we, uh, we pretty much got like trampled by like, uh, a bunch of police officers on horses and people and they were like hitting kids with nightsticks and shit. So all this, it's so bizarre that I have these experiences with them, but like people literally ran away from the police and like there was a crowd of people like falling down. And so we got trampled, like Holy shit. not trampled, but like we all kind of like fell back. And then when we got up, um, our dreams had been shattered at that point uh, because I remember like either Frank or Abe or somebody, they were just like, yeah, I don't think this is happening. I think that we should go back to the hotel. And then they were just like, all right, nice to meet you guys. And they bounced. And, uh, and I looked at my friend Ralph. And I'm like, fuck, we were about to go hang out with Deftone and go to a show. And now that happened. And then it all worked out because I ended up on tour with them. <laughs> so, yeah. That's crazy. So what was there, like, uh, like a bullfight broke out in the middle? Of, do you know what there happened? Was, there was just, uh, there, were, uh, there was a lot of uh, chaos, like, South by I had been going to for nine years and it just gets more and more weird. There was just a lot of drunk people and, and more and lots of people fucked up on drugs and there was just too much chaos and people waiting on lines to get in that were restless. So there's just a lot of fights in the street. I think this is uh, the main street that all the shit's on Red River or something. Um, but um, the cops got involved and it was like chaos and there were thousands of people outside. And we, as soon as we saw like nightsticks and people like running at us, um, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, we were like, it's time to go. I was so upset. I'm like, I was like, that's never going to happen again. Little did I know I'd be like traveling with them. Okay, cut. Hi, I'm the guy who biffed the recording of the first conversation. And uh, heads up, this will not be the last time I do this. But fast forward a few days, Chris and I sat down again. And since he's a drummer, I figured he'd be a pretty good person to ask, why is Abe so dope? His drumming is particularly special because... You talked about how there's a bop, right? There's a there's a bop that go, there's a groove, and there's something uh, that is kind of inherently uh, hip hop, in a way, which in New York is totally normal. I'm not from Sacramento, but like you know, New York hardcore, for example, has a bop to it always, uh, no matter what. It could be uh, it could be Madball or Leeway or um, Pro Mags, um, and you don't get that bop when you listen to Black Flag or Minor Threat, you would get that in New York. That's a, that's a hip hop influence. Uh, I think that Deftones uh, self-admittedly has that. They have a hip hop influence in their music uh, without it becoming Limp Biscuit or any of those things, you know? It, and, then, and it's the beat that drives that. And Abe, like, uh, uh, well, Abe has a placement of the way that he decides when the snare is going to hit and where the bass drum is going to hit that if you're not a drummer you're not really going to think about so much but it has an effect on the listener whether they realize it or not i mean that's music in general you know not everyone's a musician you don't know why you're bopping your head but he is the uh, heartbeat and pulse of deftones if he wasn't there they wouldn't be the same band you might we might not like it as much it's that beat and uh if i'm going to get technical as a drummer he has what we call ghost notes and little things that you hear on songs like digital bath or um, really just a lot of, so there's a lot of songs with drum intros. I, I, I'm not going to be able to remember all the titles, but um, he's got stuff he does with his hi hats and with the snare drum. Digital bath is the one that starts out with drums, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's a prime, prime, prime example of what I'm talking about. If anyone needed to just hear uh, an example of what I'm talking about, that beat right there is exactly what i'm talking about and you know? i know what you're and i know what you're referring to with um some of those like uh with the ghost notes and like some of the nuance even though i'm not a drummer and i don't know anything about it like i know enough to have identified some of those influences that people talk about like I, i've I, in listening to like the police and hearing some of stuart copeland like oh, isms yeah. or whatever um 
Um, but uh, the last time we talked, you also mentioned bad brains, and and I and I I went and listened to I Against I like, holy shit. Did you did you not like were you not as familiar with that until I told you to listen to that? I mean, I've listened to Bad Brains, um, but I I guess never specifically listening to or for like because you were like I think it was Regeneration, a reignition, a reignition. Yeah, reignition is the song that you pointed to. Is Deftones being born right there, dude? I was like, whoa. If you want to figure out where like how Deftones even exist, I would put on reignition. In my opinion, that's what I hear. I'm not saying that that I'm not. I can't speak for them, but that song is Deftones career in, in, in fucking in one song, you know, it's, it's remarkable how throughout that entire album, but especially that song, because like I listened, I went and I searched, I sought out the song and then I was like, oh, wow. And then listened to the whole album. I was like, there's like all sorts of stuff in here the, from melody to oh, like style, like all of it. Uh, absolutely, man. And then we're getting deep into the whole band sound. But to, before we get off Abe too. You know, I just want to find something here uh, on the uh, on the uh, Deftones um, album. RX Queen, dancey. It's a dancey beat. It's not hip hop. He also has something there going on that's a dancey stuff, like uh, RX Queen. At, but it's groove. It's still a groove. Um, also, let's just uh, mention one other thing about um, about Deftones and and their um, groove, which is Stuart Copeland. Uh, like you just mentioned, I mentioned that the other day to you off the record, which is that he is a uh, Stuart Copeland uh, fan. And, um, you know, every night I was on tour with them, they played the police as their intro music before they came out. That's how I made the connection. And there's a lot of things that Stuart Copeland did in a mainstream rock band with hit singles that most drummers wouldn't do. Most drummers in a, in a big rock band are going to keep it simple unless you're Rush or, uh, or Tool or something like that. This guy and, and, Stuart Copeland, he was hitting the bell and doing all this weird shit that all these people at the police concerts are not listening to that, but that's what Abe does too. There's a direct connection. And so, yeah, the Bad Brains, man, put on Adrenaline. You put on the first song on Adrenaline and listen to Reignition, and you can tell where they fucking got their shit from. Not to mention, the ent- I should have told you this, but the entire album Quickness, man, that's got Chino all over it. And that streak that Chino does, that high pitch streak, that's yeah. bad. Brains. That is not taken from anyone else but the bad brains, hands down, taken from bad brains. It, I don't know why it hadn't, um, like, because I've explored plenty of Deftones influences in the past and have heard bad brains brought up tons of times and, and definitely have listened to bad brains. But it seemed like, I don't know, something recently that the last listen, it was like it totally clicked it's, and the vocals stood out. Like it all, it all oh. made so much sense. Big time. You have, I've, I've read social media comments and like things of like old hardcore guys that for whatever reason happened to be at a Deftones show or saw a band and Deftones played the fest and like, oh yeah, I just saw like the best Bad Brains tribute. <laughs> um, you know, and that's not a knock on them, but you know, they've had HR get up on stage and play with them. And not to mention the, uh, as early as the Adrenaline days, they covered Right Brigade. Um, Many times I've seen them play, uh, cover it three times on online from then to now. So uh, and and fucking um, there's a Bad Brains documentary, and in the trailer, Chino says that HR is the best uh, living vocalist of all time. And you know I've seen Abe wearing the Bad Brains hat. So you know it's, it's so it's some people don't know because but but it, that's where it came from. <laughs> it's, it's it's really cool uh, when you um, hear artists talk about their influences and they definitely wear them on their sleeve, but they've also f- like departed from those and really matured. To, so to like see the the evolution of how those uh, influences and the style develops and changes and, and that that's always really fascinating. Uh, oh, yeah, you're me. right. I mean, I mean, I, I keep bringing up Digital Bath because I think that's my favorite Deftones song, but um that doesn't sound like bad brains at all i mean you could tell right. that you know they they also are influenced by faith no more which is obvious to me so you know there's that but you know you know what i heard um abe say on uh he was uh sitting in on oh uh, now i'm gonna draw a blank on his name the the drummer from uh primus has like a oh, yeah Tim, like Tim a, of alexander yes, totally yes. yeah he's, he's got he's got that shit too he's got like a like a like a 
like an Instagram live happy hour sort of thing that he does. And so Abe was guesting on it recently. And he he mentioned that uh, my own summer um, that boom pop is he said he he said he ripped off Phil Collins on uh, Easy Lover, the uh, the Philip Philip Bailey song. And, and so I wouldn't listen to it. And you hear it. Like, but the, like the drums are a rip off. He was like, that's me doing Phil Collins. Dude, you know, it's funny. First of all, I didn't know that. That's amazing. But um, uh, a friend of mine listened to errors on ohms and then and was like, yo, that's that's why known as Big Brown Beaver by Primus, that drum beat. And if you listen to My Name is Mud, the drum, the drums on that sound like eight, too. But if you put on Winona's Big Brown Beaver uh, back to back with Errors, it, it's 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 not like I don't think it's on purpose, but the drumming is is incredibly similar. I'm totally gonna check that out as soon yeah. as we get off this conversation. <laughs> I'm totally gonna check it's a goofy out. song, but like you can you'll probably be able to tell what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, music musically, like I mean, obviously they were pretty goofy, Primus, but they are yeah. also incredible and. But I mean, dude, if you if you listen to like Corn or any new metal, like you can kind of draw it back to that like i never heard corn in my life when i heard primus like they didn't exist and when when you really think about it or and even if you read interviews specifically with uh, the drummer david silviera um he has a video of himself recently covering a primus song and talking about how influential they were so like you hear that shit and whatever you want to say about fieldy i'm not saying that i'm not for fieldy or or into fieldy i'm just saying like that's primus right there that's red hot chili peppers and primus <laughs> I, I digress but no but that's actually a wonderful segue into um uh into the the bass uh because i think the rhythm section it's, it's sort of your sort of your wheelhouse so <laughs> i would i would love to uh to hear you talk about um sergio and uh chi a, a little bit and and um yeah Absolutely. how that how that how that works how, how did well, they make that work yeah they're both they're both very different bass players which is interesting but the end the thing I um, the bass the bass is extremely present and integral to Deftones music. Uh, you know something about a band with one guitar player and one bass player not. Um, you know Chino plays guitar sometimes too, but I feel like it's like almost um, you know you you can hear the separation of instruments um, and so the bass really stands out on its own and 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 and. Um, the thing is, Chi is a guy that played with his fingers, and he grooved really well, and he was in the pocket with uh, with Abe. And um, you know, I'll, I, it took me a while to realize that uh, when I, you know, I just it wasn't the first thing that I thought about when I thought about Deftones, right? Like um, when you hear some of the bands I mentioned, specifically Primus or Corn or, um, or 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 the Chili Peppers or something like that, you hear the bass is up front. It's yeah, it's, it leads um, right. Yeah, not really like what. The, the, what you're going to Deftones for, right? But it's there and it's integral. Um, and and she was real smooth uh, the way he played. If you like isolated the music, there was he was smooth. Now what's interesting is that Sergio is a, a strictly and very proudly, and I say that because I've talked to him and heard him talk about it. He plays with the pick. Um, there are videos of him on Fender uh, commercials playing with the pick. He loves playing with the pick, and he even plays with. Um, this weird six string bass thing now that's almost like a guitar uh, with a pick. Um, it's a, it couldn't be more different from how Chi plays, fundamentally speaking. And if you listen to Quicksand, it's very pick based playing, but he kind of figured out a way to emulate. And I think that's the respect that he had probably for the Deftown sound. You're not going to walk into, you know, any of these bands. You don't, you don't step into a, a known band and then change you don't walk into Met Metallica and change Cliff Burton's bass parts. You know, you don't do that. I mean, they've had numerous bass players, but Jason Newstead, even though he played with a pick and uh, now they have Robert Trujillo with his fingers, they're all very different bass players. But when they play Master of Puppets or Battery, they're not fucking with Master of Puppets or Battery. You don't do that. Right. So uh, he, he found a way with a pick to play all of those uh, Deftone songs the, an honor of Chi the way that he uh, should. And um, he brought his own flavor with, uh, I think, Diamond Eyes. He pro I mean, I, I can't speak for him. I'm saying just like, I would imagine going into Diamond Eyes and he did a fantastic job. You know, that's got to be a little um, tough. And, and they actually said that he had a lot to do with the songwriting on that and reinvigorated the band. 
but he really came into his own. And when I listen to Ohms, there are bass parts where I'm like, that's quicksand. You know, that's a quicksand bass. He ripped himself off. It's yeah, his really? Style, you know, so you can hear that on the new quicksand record, Illuminance, and um, and the new Deftones record. You're like, oh, dude, that's that's the same bass player. You know? I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you, like, how... Um uh like how much what you recognize of sergio's work from quicksand has oh. crept into to deftone sound no brainer put on fucking well if you just want to hear what 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 sergio's signature sound is and what he does put on the song omission it starts off with bass the whole song is a uh, is based off of bass but um um I, all of their songs are fucking so bass driven but that's omission is the most powerful bass line that that guy ever wrote in his life, hands down, including quick, including the Deftones material. Sorry, but that that's like his. That's the most powerful bass thing he ever did in his life. Fucking awesome, you know. It's really it's really cool to see how seamlessly uh, he's he's become um, a, like a, a well ten year now member of this band. Like that's. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's uh, and everything he does, it fits like it just fits. Um, you've already talked about the playing, the performance, like his performance is right with what they do. Like there's just so much. Aesthetic, his aesthetic, you know, the aesthetic. Yeah, like like all he of it. Like he's supposed to be in the band. Even if she was around, he just looks like he should be in the band with them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Um, I, I'm glad that you brought up Diamond Eyes too, because I know that's your that's your favorite. That's you, I no, ha, I have, no, it's not. It's up. There. Oh, it's not. No, no. Uh, but, um, address, uh, um, uh, um, around the fur is. Oh, by the way, one one quick thing. Yeah, please. And sir, people don't know this. Sergio is a hip hop DJ, so that's something else that people may not realize. He is a DJ here in New York, um, and that's how I met him. Uh, because before he was in Deftones, because and that that's that's that also I think is uh, an important thing to to add as to like where these guys get that flavor from. You know, I mean, he wasn't in the band for those early records, but they have a bass player in their band who's a hip hop DJ. So what does that say about the band right there? You know what I mean? And like, no doubt. Yeah. Um, and 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 um, and quick shout out to his company because I am a recent transplant to vegan but everyone check out his clothing line pin shape and gamo if you if you don't know what that is that's his vegan clothing line so but yeah i just had to shout out some sergio shit but yeah anyway <laughs> i've been actually i've i've followed him um and uh i've seen you post about um uh vegan food and stuff and and uh I, i'll admit it like i've definitely i watched that uh movie on netflix um that was about like the it was it was the one about the vegan athletes and like um, oh yeah. yeah and I was just like blown away by how you know they're, these are best athletes in the world and that and there are so many more that are going vegan and it's like we, you know we we try so hard to at least it, in, it, do it, it once a week up. yeah you feel yeah. so much better your body just changed like you feel lighter you feel uh, refreshed it's different like I believe that your body did like the human body wasn't initially purposed to consume meat i think that yeah. vegans are super onto something sergio is is fucking very disciplined on tour with how he handles his body that yeah. dude was fucking always going to the gym in every city that existed like every city he went to and his diet was on point and these guys by the way just to give you a little insight the deftones they can eat man they they had serious catering back <laughs> to I'm talking like <laughs> we think from barbecues to huge fucking platters of shit to like every cakes and all sorts of stuff back there. There was always cakes and all sorts of food back there. Lots of eating going on. And uh, Sergio always was super disciplined. He wasn't eating as much as anybody. And he was always going to the gym. And he talked about it a lot. He was on some special diet, I remember. But um, that guy is super healthy. I can't imagine. I'm going to drop this too, by the way. I'm flexing. Yeah. We're at, we actually go to the same gym, and that's another reason why I see him around. So oh, no shit. I have like a lot of weird connections to that guy. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's wild. crazy. I mean, I think about New York as being like one of the biggest cities in the world. Like to think that you would uh, like continue to cross paths with somebody is, yeah, is pretty wild. Sometimes when he's not when he's not on tour, like working on his, um, he's got some like um, uh, like like physical 
therapy kind of shit just to like stretch out like so like i'll just go in there sometimes and he's just with a trainer i'm like hey what's up man that's <laughs> so kind of rad yeah. I mean, I would imagine you you have to take care of your body, right? Like to bounce around on the stage. Like I don't care how old you are, but let's not. I yeah. mean, let's yeah. not be like they're not exactly you know young dogs in the game anymore. Like you got to stay on top of it. You got to take care of your body, right? Absolutely. And you see him fucking jumping around and screaming and singing. Dude is bouncy as hell. Yeah, he bounces up and down on the stage. It's pretty nice. <laughs> you know what? I'm glad that you brought up the um the fact that he's a hip hop DJ too, because uh, you talked about it with Abe and that there's a hip hop influence there, but we don't really talk a whole lot about their hip hop influences, like specifically like which artists they might have uh, pulled from or, or were drawn to. Do you have any uh, guesses about that? I'm ashamed that I don't know. And for a very specific reason, because I not only was on tour with them, but every night, uh, backstage, they played hip hop exclusively, and I never wrote down or shazammed any of the stuff that was playing. But I did notice from day one that backstage it was straight up hip hop the entire time. Like during the show, like in, in between bands, before the show, and after the show, it was only hip hop that I ever heard backstage. So, That's awesome. kind That's of a really bummer that I never figured it out. But, um, I don't, did you get that on recording when I told you the cool Keith story, though? You did get uh, that. The cool key story I did get, yes, okay, yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, that. But that, but that, um, I, I wondered too, like thinking about that story, like, is it was it just eighties guys? Like, what are they into, uh, hip hop wise? I mean, I know on the the festivals that they've curated, they've always had hip hop acts. Hell, Future, I think, was the headliner, the co headliner, the the first uh, Dia de los Deftones. So I know there's an interest there, but like, um, yeah, yeah, well, what specifically is curious? It's fun. I mean, they were supposed to tour with Run the Jewels. So, you know, and that's my other, my two favorite records of 2020 are uh, Deftones, uh, Ohms, and, and RTJ4. Uh, um, did I get that right? Is it RTJ4? Yeah. I yeah, so. I think it's four. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh la la, that, that beat is just. Uh, come on now. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Man, and then I'll, and we'll get into it because you mentioned, but for like Frank, Frank DJs as well, when he's not, not in the band, but I'm saying like at clubs. Um, and that's kind of what he does, you know, I've watched his, uh, he'll go live on Twitch and, um, like, it's not just the music that's dope, but the visuals are also very dope. So you, like, um, I get the, you get the sense definitely that they've been doing this, you know, the DJing, the, uh, that, that sort of, uh, creative output. Um, although I, I guess I haven't seen, I know Sergio's done like at least one or two Twitch DJ sets, but. He does that a lot, yeah. When he's not playing video games, um, <laughs> when he's not playing Animal, uh, whatever that uh, game is called, uh, Animal something. Um, but uh, uh, dude, he's a. <laughs> I could talk about Sergio for a while, I, I, but but like he he DJs places where he doesn't advertise who he is, and and there might not be anybody there, and he just has fun, um, and that's how dedicated he is. It's one one cool perk about being a New Yorker. Is that like throughout my life, I have walked into places and just seen him at a bar, just like sitting there DJing. And there might be like five people in the room. <laughs> you know I mean? Does that uh, ever blow your mind? And you're like, yo, does it, does not, does nobody else know who that is? <laughs> well, it, it, it does now. And one time he was DJing at a bar that I co owned that nobody knew he was at. And he told me not to uh, like say anything about that. Uh, but somebody were, like figured it out, and then at some point at like, two in the morning, people start showing up with like sharpies and Deftones uh, 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 posters, and I almost felt like I had to do security. And he was like, "It's fine, I'm good." But um, but prior to that, before he was in Deftones and he had only filled in uh, when he wasn't in a band, it was actually quite normal to like walk into a bar and see him DJing. Um, and he, you know, and it wasn't like, "Oh, this guy's in Deftones." He was just Sergio. <laughs> That makes me want to ask him like his favorite records to play and sort of stuff like that. You know what I mean? Cause DJs, they create an atmosphere and they move a room and they do all sorts of stuff that people who aren't creating have no idea what's going on. I mean, his favorite stuff that I'm aware of that he's told me that's not hip hop is um, freestyle music. Uh, he mentioned uh, to me, I, I tried to get him to talk to me about uh, Slayer's legacy for a revolver article. And he was like, um, I'm not your guy for that, to be honest with you. But if you want to talk about Lisa Lisa or Information Society 
or like that kind of shit, I could talk to that. I could talk to you about that forever. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's cool as hell. That's cool as hell. I love that. Uh, I love that. Um, inside knowledge 80s like dance and like do it like that's cool as hell that's that's super awesome yeah um okay so so around the fur is your favorite but you thought diamond eyes was the best is that oh no i was saying a lot i know a lot of people that that say that diamond eyes is their number one and i know brendan from incendiary said that on your podcast yeah yeah Um, Two people that I work with who run Revolver Magazine have Diamond Eyes as their number one. So that that's probably what you thought I was saying. But it's one of my favorites, but it's not my number one. My number one is um, is is around the fur, and then my number two is it's kind of a, it's it's White Pony and then Diamond Eyes. Those are my okay. top. Oh, I see. I've got a little line scribbled here. I, I'm I'm ignoring the line and just looking at the <laughs> notes that I made. Yeah. Um, haphazard, like okay. So, uh, what do you think it is about Diamond Eyes uh, that that makes people think that that is such a a great record? I mean, it's in your top three. I I, I feel like I sort of understand around the fur to be your maybe personal connection um, to the music that that in, that makes it, it really easy. really did it for me and really like like became the record that like i was like hooked absolutely hooked like adrenaline was cool but fucking around the fur was when i was hooked but diamond eyes um deftones like developed a dark haunting sound and atmosphere with with um around the fur and then really expanded on that with white pony and and it's not like they haven't done it since. In fact, you know, since I last spoke to you, I uh, should tell you that uh, self-titled, I have a newfound appreciation for. So you, yes, you, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and I was also like, these songs rule. Why would I not rank this, you know, up there? Um, like I always liked it. I don't know what I was thinking. It's just so hard, right? But um, but Diamond Eyes, like. Around the Fur is great because it starts with that and like this fucking like hits you immediately. Yeah. Diamond Eyes does that too with that like fucking like like kind of creeps in and just like it just goes in and you're just like fuck yeah dude. Like you're just in it immediately. There's no like kind of they're, they're really good with that with certain albums like with Koi. It's like just fucking right away. It's like bam, bam, bam. You know like mm-hmm. fucking um uh, but but the, the fact that Diamond Eyes does that and it's like this like um, that I'm gonna speak as a drummer, but it's like a three four time signature groove, uh, like a waltz. It's not. Um, it's it's just it's super unique and weird. And and but you but you're just in it right away. And then when the chorus opens up, you're just like it's fucking great. It's just a great intro. And Rocket Skates is one of the best songs that I've ever heard. Um, it's unbelievable. Um, and there's no skipper on that record. He goes straight from the top. It's fucking fantastic. And he switched producers on that. Uh, uh, Nick Rasculinus, and he uh, he did like Foo Fighters and Rush and Coheed. And, you know, Terry Date was such a great producer for Deftones, who we now hear back on Ohms, which I think is a big reason why it sounds like that. But, uh, but they just they came fresh with a fucking new bass player and a new producer after having recorded an album that they didn't release that's tough man and they fuck it and like two records that weren't as heralded or celebrated um and they just came back and like boom fucking here they are it was uh, it was such a surprise i remember like there was uh i think a lot of uncertainty like what is this gonna be like like she is she is gone there like you said eros was sort of in the wind and nobody knew still it seems like nobody knows what what may or may not happen with that music uh, great but then, song that they, they played that live though you were there right it, 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 yeah, it yeah. sounded like a classic from the fir- from the first moment you heard it you know i don't know what is gonna come of that unreleased material um uh, what do you think what do you what what where first of all where is it is it just sitting in somebody's computer somewhere what what do you think is like I this. have no idea. I mean, I, I, I think when that, those things happen, it's just kind of shelved and, you know, you never know. I, I, I couldn't tell you, but, but, uh, but, you know, maybe it's one of those things where, you know, you know, it's an, it maybe, maybe it's a birthday or an anniversary of chi. I don't know. I mean, that you have to kind of wonder to yourself, like, you know, when's the right time, 
But yeah. those are kind of like in my mind, like kind of my uh, wishful thinking. Like maybe, maybe it'll be some kind of like, um, an- like his anniversary of something, and they want to celebrate him, or you know, maybe maybe Ohms is so good they they can't top it, and they think that the next release should finally be Arrows. Not that they can't top it, but you know what I mean. They just feel like you know we just did that that kicked ass. Should, you know, are we going to do the same thing over and over again? Here's a new record. Here's a new record. You know, yeah. we get older. Maybe it's time, you know, maybe that's the next record. You know, I don't know. Well, it, it seems to certainly add to the mystique because there's always been a bit of a mystique um, with the band. You know, you never really, I, I feel like as a fan, I never really 100% knew what was going on uh, within the band. Uh, definitely in the past, over the past 10 years, they've become more um, like, they've just become bigger and and more successful and i think more accessible or more um uh candid so um it's it's cool to like get to know them and learn about them at this stage in the game but there still is a mystique and and that eros record like that being out there is like yeah like, man i mean that saw they played it live i wish i had known you i was there uh and, oh no and, shit yeah yeah um that uh yeah it was a great day um but uh when i when when they kicked into it and the chorus hit i was like this sounds so familiar in the same way even though i never heard it in the way that a classic song would do that you know like where you're just where like you know stone temple pilot song comes on the radio or a pearl jam song or a nirvana song like oh i know that that's just part of my life like it sounded like it was like this pre-existing thing that like you would have heard a million times like a, cl- a true classic, but mm. it's the first time you were hearing it. I don't know if that makes any sense. I think it does. Yeah, there's a quality. There was a quality to that song that um, that did harken back to you know their their yeah. I don't know, the golden age, I guess, for lack of a better word. But yeah. still sounded new and like ethereal, and the the chorus was like you know soaring. It was. It sounded sort of like uh, something that was in between that era, that Diamond Eyes era. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's live too. Imagine what it sounds like on recording, blasting speakers. You know what I mean? Are there are there <laughs> any moments? I mean, since you got to do, uh, you got to go out on tour and do some dates. Were there any uh, shows or any moments at shows <clears throat> like just in watching them perform that um, stand out to you? Maybe. Uh, offered some insight as a player or um, you just thought we're fucking cool. Yeah, actually I, um, well, for one thing, I think I mentioned this when we were talking uh, like seeing just in general, watching them outside, which I've seen a bunch of times. They are a great band to watch at night outside. There's something about it. I saw them outside at Coney, uh, Coney Island Amphitheater uh, as a stone pony in Asbury park. Um, and I've seen them, I saw them at Dia de los Deftones. Uh, is that how they pronounce it when they say it? They should. <laughs> I think that's amazing. I don't think I've ever heard somebody do it, but we, sh- we should from now on Deftones. definitely put that accent over the last <laughs> D. Yeah. Um, that's a little, I'm Filipino, so I guess it's a little bit of my Hispanic side coming out. That's but right. um, I, uh, I, I, I've seen, I saw them once. I wish I knew what, what, which city it was, but two, two, like two or three, three things. Like um, one time I saw them side stage in some random city. I just couldn't tell you where, maybe it was Portland. I have no idea where like me and my bandmates were kind of like alone on like a elevated sort of side stage area, just looking down. And I, and just like if taking it all in um, and I've watched them play like standing behind Abe while he's playing and just like felt like the fucking thunder and kind of just like looking up and it's just his back and he's fucking like, like you're feeling like it's everything underneath you is fucking like just like rumbling like an earthquake and he's fucking going nuts. And he's got the fan blown on him and his hair is blown back and he's just fucking like killing it. Uh, so I've had a lot of those moments where I'm just like, fuck man, I wish I could fucking just like be able to like be up on a fucking riser like that just fucking like destroying shit like that, you know, looks, you know, um, so the, uh, but just watching them outside at night is, 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 is my kind of like when they, when they just, when they go into digital bath at night and it's that haunting thing with the little sounds that Frank makes in the background or, um, also I would say I saw them outside at South by Southwest in Texas during the daytime and they played, um, 
that first song on um on um around the fur and fucking um bushwick bill rest in peace uh came out and rapped uh with with them for the for the entire intro um actually no he he rapped for digital baths intro but anyway just seeing that was during the daytime not at night but seeing them outside uh playing at south by was another memory that i have dude that's wild <laughs> when i talked to uh brendan from incendiary and uh, i mentioned to him that like they always feel like the sunset band like they go oh, on yeah. right there at sunset you know what i mean like they have that magical way of just taking you from from day to night you know what i mean dude you get this feeling of like nostalgia and goosebumps and just fucking everything about it is just seeing them in coney island or um asbury park where it's like the ocean is there to your side and it's nighttime and not to sound all fucking emo but like it's like stars and the ocean and it's nighttime and there's a breeze and they're playing this shit it's, there's nothing like that man like there's no band that i've seen that i had that feeling i've had the pleasure of seeing that many times um but yeah i remember brendan uh brendan saying that it was like incendiary played uh hellfester or one of those festivals and got to see mm-hmm. them and yeah i mean i guess i could relate some on that too because when you're when you play a show and you're done and then you're just like fuck i'm now gonna watch this this is it's so rewarding <laughs> i mean what a treat to be able to like do what you love to do and then walk off and then watch other bands that you love to to hear i appreciate it more now than i ever did man yeah when we when we come back when when all of this returns it's going to feel uh, next level victorious every show will be special you know and when this shit goes back to normal i will fly to shows now to see bands yeah. you know what i mean i because I, i'm going to want to be there so much and i'm never going to miss a show that comes through my town because i'm tired anymore or like man. i have to wake up early i relate to that so entirely so entirely yeah yeah those those moments yeah, we we need them. We need them back so bad. Um, okay, um, this our our conversation is going to be like an hour and a half instead of an hour because I've got two sh- uh, two shows basically now. So um, I, I want to get to your recommendations again. So um, uh, if you would offer three recommendations um, of absolutely anything, it's it's uh, whatever you think is worth putting people onto. Okay. RTJ4, Run the Jewels, most important record that came out in 2020, actually recorded and written before George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Uh, but how fitting. And I know they wanted to put it out because they were like, we need to do it now. Um, and, and he says, I can't breathe in a song, which is wild, because that was before all that shit went down. It's the most important record that came out this year, hands down on, um, you know, just on so many levels and it's also just a great it's great music so there's that <clears throat> if you're vegan or experimenting uh, uh and wanting to go that route and this is for you woody i don't know if you are a vegetarian but i'm trying to i'm trying to at least get to like a day a week and where i commit to not eating any animal products because i do feel it you feel it after a day well this is going to be a loaded uh suggestion but i suggest Especially if you're a Deftones fan, Sergio's vegan, and if you become vegan, it'll make you can buy his clothes and uh, wear the uh, Pinche Vingano stuff, and you won't be a poser. You'll actually be a real vegan when you wear his, <laughs> his clothing line. This is like a whole fucking Sergio uh, me promoting him. I should be his publicist, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, and so I'm gonna send this to him when when it's done. <laughs> but uh, but um. You, you should. There are great meat alternatives if you're afraid of missing meat. Uh, I the first one I'm going to recommend is a brand called Light Life. When they make great ratwurst and um and and hamburgers, um and I eat that because I'm very allergic to certain uh, things. I'm it's soy and gluten free, but the the easy ones are the Impossible, uh, which you can even get at like fucking you know White Castle at, or Fridays I think or the Beyond Burger. Um, and there's a thing called uh, Gardein. Uh, or a company called Corn with a Q, and they make really good chicken substitutes. So, like, there is something for everything um, if you're going to miss it, and you know, and you're not going to be like hurting anybody or the environment. You know, it's all made out of plants, and it's fucking pretty. Con- I've had steaks and 
sausage pizzas and chicken heroes made from this stuff. It's it's super easy to get, guys. I always wonder about like preparation. That's that's the part that starts to scare me. It's not even like, am I going to miss meat or, you know, because I could have chick- chicken is chicken. You know what I mean? Like, it's great, but it's also it's, it's chicken. But it's like preparation. Like, um, I think about like, how, how do I what do I do with this carrot? Like, I don't know how to cook this. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they do it for you, you know? I mean, you don't have to do anything. There's a fucking bunch of patties or so, just like, just like quote unquote real meat. I mean, just buy a package of it at Whole Foods, you know? Yeah. Go home and try it. Uh, number three, I'm going to do a shameless plug, but um, I just played drums on the score for an incredible skateboarding uh, documentary that just was released on Amazon Prime Video, and it's called Rom Boys. Um, and it's about a legendary skate park in the UK. Uh, that started in the 80s, and it's about skateboarding, um, and it's got some very familiar American skateboarders in it. Um, and uh, me and two guys, actually, who are huge Deftones fans, and we have a separate, uh, we have a text group called uh, Di- Diamond Guys. That's our that's our text group. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> a bunch that's of us. So great. Fernando Martinez uh, is in that group and his favorite band is also Deftones. He wrote the entire score to the film with the exception of like a couple stock things and two acoustic songs. The entire film was written by him and me. I played drums on most of it uh, along with Jay Crawford, a great drummer. Um, and his fa- he's also in the diamond guys group and, uh, and, 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 um, and one of his favorite bands is Deftones. So I check out Rom Boys, the documentary, um, if you want to, uh, you know, check out some cool skateboarding shit. Chris Enriquez from Spotlights, Total Meltdown, Age of Quarantine, Revolver, Vegan Chef. I am so grateful to Chris for his time and generosity, his insight, and uh, frankly, to have been introduced to him. And for that, I have to thank Brendan Garone from Incendiary. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, When the world turns right side up again, top of my list is a genuine real life New York hardcore show with you dudes or an incendiary show. That would be awesome. Or a spotlight show. That would be stellar. Honestly, I'm so sick that tour with Deftones and Refuse never made it to Minneapolis. Chris mentioned the show in Salt Lake City when Chino joined spotlights on stage. That is on their YouTube channel. And it's dope. In fact, I would call it a must watch. It is that rad. Speaking of rad, Chris has one more story to share. Then uh, I'll mention a few guests I've got coming up on the pod. But first, listen to this. When we're talking about Sergio being a hip hop DJ, I was going to say Frank is a hip hop DJ, too, because I've been to bars in Sacramento where he was DJing um, and he used to DJ backstage a lot. But um, Spotlights, my band played um, at uh, some legendary place in Sacramento that like everybody had played at or been to at some point. It was pretty wild. And um, Abe, Cunningham showed up to the show and I was like, you know, leading up to it, I was like, I wonder if we just have been forgotten by them. Like, are they ever going to fucking come see us play? Like, I know I've run into these guys that through my job stuff, but, uh, but he came out and um, Sarah still, my, my bass player still talks to him. Uh, I think she talks to him the most. Uh, well, yeah, she talks to him the most out of all of us, like, um, which is relative. I'm just saying, cause I don't really, I don't have his number and she does, but he came out by himself and uh, the bummer was that he actually left. We stayed, he watched the opening bands that opened up for us. We headlined and he hung out, but um, I don't know if this is why, but I noticed people recognizing him. I mean, how could you not? I think that him and Frank are the only ones that, um, that still live there. Um, And by the way, him and Frank are like toxic twins. Like I see when I was in, when I had that cool Keith experience uh, in Texas, they were together and like there were times on tour where he went out to like strip malls and went drinking and it was just the two of them that, and sometimes Sergio. And then um, one time um, we played with quicksand and glass jaw and they, the two of them came out to that show together and they were That's drinking. So, all night. so they're, they're always together and, and they still live and they're like, they still uh, are the ones that are uh, remained intact in Sacramento representing, but um, people started recognizing him and taking pictures. And I can only imagine that was kind of at, to some degree, like I should probably get out of here. Um, yeah. It's not like he had like a handler. He just showed up by himself. Um, and so then uh, we had got wind that there was a, a party happening that was going to go on like 
pretty late into the evening or into the morning at a local bar and we were like we should go and so we we went and frank was djing and it was a small it was a small it was a dive bar literally like you walk in and like i can touch the other side of the wall and now the bar <laughs> and, people, and like frank is in front of me and like the entire room is like the size of like my apartment so like it was super tight and like frank's up there djing playing shit and they closed the bar down and they're like no these guys could stay and we stayed at after hours and we were fucking um drink well i was sober but my bandmates were drinking it was only like us uh me and my bandmates and and frank and abe and like a couple and employees and a couple stragglers and that somebody put on cardigans uh gran turismo one of the songs like uh from that album which i know they covered one of those which is one of my favorite records and he stopped mid sentence um to be like oh man this is the jam like i remember when we first said like i'm like is this really happening right now because like i know how much this record means to them and he's just like the first time we heard this shit like he's going into it i wish i could remember the story but i was so enamored by the fact that we were having a conversation at like after hours time um you know and um he, I don't remember why or how, but they also like told us a bunch of cheese stories in the middle of the night. No um, way, really? Yeah, I, I, I wish I could remember, but it was just the, more of the nature of like the two of them just being with us after hours and him being like, um, yeah, and she was like doing this, and then like him and Abe would laugh and he'd be like, remember this, and I'm, and they're and they're wasted too, and I'm just like, I can't believe I'm getting this vibe but i was just so i was more enamored by the fact that it was happening that i that it like was distracting me from remembering the stories and we have a photo that we all took that night and i love sarah i love you she she has it on her phone but she won't she's like i'm not sending it to you because <laughs> i post i if you follow me online i post everything i do all the time like you'll see what i had for like breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and what I'm listening to throughout the day and not very private. And she was like, nope, it's it's in your memory. This is a sacred memory. It's on my phone. I'm not sending it to you. Oh, man, I love that so much. Don't send it to me. Damn, I love Gran Turismo so much. This story spoke to me on so many levels. But most of all, hearing the dudes were reminiscing about Chi, that was awesome, man. Thank you, Chris. You are the shit. Uh, my name is Woody. You can reach me at Woodbra on Twitter and Instagram if you want to talk about the podcast. I've got some killer guests lined up. Zach and Kelly from 30 Nights of Violence, a sick band out of Nashville with a clearly sick-ass name. Uh, I've got a gentleman by the name of Darren Eggleston, who was the radio promotions guy for Maverick Records during Adrenaline and Around the Fur. And uh, he told me about the riot in Arizona in 96. I, I had never heard that story before. Uh, he was there. And uh, I've also got the VP of Creative at Warner Records, Frank Maddox, uh, coming up on the show. He spoke to me for an hour. You are going to trip out when you hear his complete Deftones story. Thank you for listening to Deftones. Thank you for listening to Change in the House of Pods.